There you go. Well done. So thanks again, everybody, for, for showing up today. Um, we're here just to have a round table here about the county aid action plan. So we're gonna do a bit of an overview of what the plan is about, um, your potential role in the county's success with it. And uh, we wanna find out some ways that we might be able to help you and your, and your organization, uh, because inevitably Dauphin County and Tri-County Regional Planning Commission will be soliciting funds to support the implementation of our plan. And one of our intentions is to support our partners like you, are, like you all. So uh, thanks for joining. Uh, as Steve Deck just noted, this is being recorded. So if you don't like that, feel free to leave. You can uh, listen to it another time. So I guess since I'm speaking, I'll introduce myself and first, then I'll let Steve and Eric introduce themselves. I'm Erin Latavik. I'm a civil engineer with Herbert Rowan and Grubick, or HRG. Um, I'm situated in the southern end of Dauphin County in the Conewago Creek watershed. And uh, I'm the County Aid Action Plan Coordinator for, for Dauphin County. So Steve, Eric, feel free. Yeah, I'll, this is Steve Deck. Uh, I'm the Executive Director here at Tri-County. With me spread out across the conference room is Jerry Duke, who's our Dauphin County Planning Coordinator, and Alexa Korber, who's our Environmental Planner here at Tri-County. Okay, um, I'm Eric Nagusky. For those of you who don't who don't know me, um, the manager up here at the uh, conservation district. Um, you know, we've been working with Aaron and and Steve and and everybody else at um, Tri County um, to get this thing rolling. Um, Rob Frank is on the call as well. He's our watershed specialist here at the district. Um, we finally. I put off writing him into all this until now. So, <laughs> um, uh, Rob will I'm sure will help, um, play a part uh, in this whole thing. And um, it's just nice to see everybody finally get together and start talking about this. Yeah, I'll echo that. Um, on the next slide here, have some some questions that we'd like to get out on the table for all of, all of the participants. And and Rob. In my mind, you're a participant because you're kind of new to the to the CAP team here. Um, so I believe Steve Deck has a roll call he can run through. Um, what we're looking for is your name, your organization that you represent today, recognizing that you may wear a number of hats, um, the role you play within your organization, watersheds where you're active, and then we want to hear what your favorite thing is about Dauphin County. So. I told you my watershed. I think my favorite thing about Dauphin County um, is the diversity of landscape. So, Steve, maybe you can give the first two people their their lead in. So, number person number two can start thinking about it. Thanks. Yeah, I, I have kind of an awkward version of the sign-in sheet. So, I think what Aaron has is alphabetical. But I'm going to go through my list and just call out names and give you the opportunity to identify those things that she uh, just listed. So according to what I have here, attendance, we have Kristen. Kristen, I don't know if you say Coke or Koch, uh, but we'll let you start. Hi, uh, Kristen on the phone here. Um, so we'll probably won't be quite as chatty today as I maybe normally am. Um, but I am with the Penn State Agriculture and Environment Center, um, and a lot of our work is in the Conewago Creek, um, although we've um, done some things in the Sotara as well. Um, and uh, my role specifically, I'm a program manager within the Agriculture and Environment Center, and so I do a lot of partnership coordination um, within the Conewago. We have the Conewago Creek Initiative, which is um, like over over 30 partners sort of working together on restoration in that particular um, creek. So I do a lot of that um, coordination there as well as in some watersheds in Lancaster County, um, but also coordinate um, volunteers through our Greening the Lower Susquehanna program. Um, and uh, I guess my favorite thing about Dawson County is um, that we have some great partners that um, are always super easy to work with um, and we call on each other a lot and it's really great. So glad to be here today. Thanks. I, I have next on my list, Ann Wayne. Ann? Hi, I do wear a bunch of hats. Um, I volunteer with various organizations. I am a newly minted but not quite official 
master watershed steward in this year's class. Hi, Casey. And um, my, I'm, I'm active part, uh, primarily in the Paxton Creek watershed. And my favorite thing about Dauphin County is the mountain ridge. Ridges. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, Sally Zano. Uh, hi. Um, okay, I'm with Manada Conservancy. I'm the current president uh, of that organization. We are a land trust that just, we basically cover all of Dauphin County. Um, so technically any watershed where we're doing projects we're active in, but we have a major focus on the Swatara Creek corridor. Um, we've done a number of projects that include Paxton Creek um, and then up in Powell's Valley, Powell's and Armstrong Creek, we have projects there that we really, um, you know, are trying to work on. Um, my favorite thing about Dauphin County is really just that it is such a crossroads between the mountain ridge and the, uh, the Susquehanna River, which both are just such large landscapes and have such a, an effect on not just our county, but such a large area of the eastern part of the country and that we're, the, we're like right in the crossroads. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to include Rob Frank because you're new to this uh, process, as Eric said. So Rob, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Rob uh, Frank. I'm the watershed specialist with the Conservation District. Um, a lot of what I do there is monitoring. There's also seeking out grant funding and working on other projects, working with the different partners. I recognize everyone so far. And um, to echo what other people have said, my favorite part about the county is that you have a little bit of everything there from ag and urban areas, pristine waterways, you know, there's a little bit of everything. There's a challenge that other people in my position throughout the state, um, I get a little bit of everything that they have. So it uh, keeps me on my toes. Cool. And Casey, Casey Clouser. Hello, I'm Casey Clouser. <clears throat> I'm actually based out of Lebanon County, but I work with the Penn State Extension. I'm the Master Watershed Steward Coordinator for a Tri-County program, which is Dolphin, Lancaster, and Lebanon. Um, so we're in our, we just finished our second training class, but I primarily um, coordinate volunteers, finding them projects, opportunities where they can um, uh, volunteer to support organizations and work they're doing or educate the public. Um, I am sadly, this is probably my last month, I'm in the process of transitioning out of this position, but I thought I should at least 10 so I can inform the next person who takes over for me what's going on. Um, but my favorite part of Dauphin County, I was going to say, but everyone else said the same thing, but I will say I was just in Harrisburg at the Millworks for my anniversary dinner, and that was really nice. So I'll mix it up a little bit and add that in there. We'll support that selection. <laughs> All right, Aaron, that, that uh, rounds the group uh, today. Very good. Thanks for your participation. Um, so this is a bit of a presentation format, uh, but especially since this is a very manageable group, please interrupt as you have questions or ideas, or if there's something that we talk about that you'd rather dig into a little bit deeper. So here we go. Uh, so we're going to provide an overview of the countywide action plan today. Uh, I'm going to go through it very quickly. Um, there's a fabulous website that Tri-County Regional Planning Commission staff have put together that, that you can refer to in the future, and there's also a short video there that, that provides an overview. Um, we're going to review initiatives that you and your organization may be able to play a role in supporting that, that we're interested in. Um, we're going to review what's, what we're calling the quarter of opportunity as a concept. We want to have a better understanding with respect to your current capacity as an organization, uh, projects you're involved in, funding that, that you have or wish you had, um, resources, uh, et cetera. And then lastly, we want to have a better sense for how, if at all, your organization may be interested in helping the county move through uh, plan implementation. So to date, um, 
the, the this this cap planning process, I'll say cap and I mean countywide action plan firstly. Uh, the cap planning process basically started uh, around about March this year. So this is about a three month old project at this point. Um, to date, Tri-County Regional Planning Commission and the Conservation District um, are, are the lead entities for the project for Dauphin County. And they're working with HRG and Lancaster Farmland Trust as a subconsultant of ours um, as the CAP plan coordinator. We're expecting we're going to need to develop a couple action teams um, because the expectation is not that the county implements the plan all on our own. The intent is that um, we can actually elevate the work that a lot of you are already doing because a lot of the work you do actually contributes to the towards the goals of our plans. Um, I'll leave that there for the moment. Uh, so that that's the purpose of the green boxes here. And then at the at the bottom here, there's it's basically a foundation of a lot of the work that we know already happens um, that we're going to want to basically catalyze as part of our plan. So conservation planning that happens on farms. Uh, the dirt and gravel road program as an example at the district, the MS4 work group that already exists, um, activities by Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I mean, the, the list could go on and on and on. One of the points I really wanted to make though is that as we discuss this project today, be thinking about your interest and overall involvement as an individual, um, because we do have a, a, an open space over here because you're our first stakeholder uh, group meeting for this project. We're interested in, in stakeholders that want to act as advisors to the team. Um, HRG and the Farmland Trust are very interested in, in your thoughts, as are the county uh, representatives here. And this isn't just a county plan. This is a plan for anybody that, that is interested in water quality improvements within the watersheds here. So um, we'll be happy to include you in, your, in our team as an advisor if you have interest in that. It doesn't have to be a big time commitment. Um, an hour long meeting per month is, is, is what we'd be looking at. Um, or you can simply be kept up to date uh, by visiting our website and, and receiving routine emails. So um, I'm an engineer, as I said. So the first thing I wanna ask is why are we doing another plan? Especially in Dauphin County where the plans are, are done relatively routinely, some by statute, some voluntarily like the Detweiler Park um, feasibility study that I think may have wrapped up recently, I forget. Um, so so this, this plan really is about stormwater. Um, it is about regulatory compliance and MS4s. It, it does help us potentially reduce costs of stormwater uh, mitigation by enhanced grant funding opportunities. In the middle here, it's an opportunity to get more resources for stormwater improvements to farms and get better soil quality. Um, there's public engagement aspect of it, which you're participating in today. And then there's more of the, more of the water stuff, right? The improved recreational experience, um, public health opportunities with respect to drinking water sources, because those of us like me that, that are on private wells are impacted by, by our watershed quality, just like uh, public water sources are. And then of course, there's the local water quality improvement aspect of it here on the right. So there are many co-benefits. Most of the, the plan components are uh, focused on, on farm soil quality and local water quality, but we do anticipate opportunities uh, beyond just the basics. So wanted to do a quick overview of the website here. We'll provide you the slides afterwards in a PDF format. So all the links in here will be, will be live. Can you see the website on my screen by chance? I see head nods, great. So um, this is what's called a hub in ArcGIS. It's very similar to a story map. And thank you, Alexa Corber at Tri-County Regional Planning Commission for taking the initiative on this. First, the first thing I wanna mention is that our countywide action plan is actually uh, being completed with a group of counties. Uh, Dauphin, Perry, Mifflin, and Juniata counties decided to partner together whenever they received the offer from DEP to receive a grant to participate in this project. So if you're traveling around Dauphin, Perry, Mifflin, Juniata, have buddies that, that are active in those areas, they may be, they may be uh, receiving similar requests for having conversations like this. Uh, so at the top of the page, there, there is an overview of what the county would action plan is. And I mentioned a, a quick overview video that 
that uh, gives you a sense of that. And as you scroll through the website, I, I do encourage you to take some time on this in the future. There's some really great interactive maps of the region, um, including maps of, of where the MS4s are, the, the municipal separate storm sewer system municipalities. There are pie charts from a report that DEP gave us that, that was called a toolbox that gives you a sense for um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment loadings across the, the different landscapes. Uh, loads delivered from stormwater by, by, um, by different types of land cover, maps of the impaired watersheds, all the different um, types of impairments across the, the Quad County area, I'll say. Information about uh, nitrogen from uh, the farming community. Listing of current partners that we really want to expand. And then at the bottom here, I wanted to mention that there is a schedule here that we'll be populating with meetings in the future. So you'll be able to reference things um, later on if you'd like to. The last thing I want to mention is that we do have a quick survey here. So if, if you have interest in um, continuing, continuing and being part of this process more actively, please take the survey and let us know what your thoughts are. Because uh, like I said, we, we, want to, we want to build our team. All right, so, so what's the difference between the phase three watershed implementation plan, the cap, MS4s, and stormwater fees? Because in my line of work, at least, stormwater can get confusing pretty quickly, especially when you start layering these things on top of one another. So for this particular project of the cap, the state plan is the driver, the Pennsylvania phase three whip, which was only, which was finalized just a few years ago. Um, but when the Pennsylvania phase three whip was pulled together, there was recognition because of the number of stakeholders that were involved in, in the development of that plan for the Chesapeake Bay that action at the local level was going to be the thing that was going to move the needle on water quality improvements related to the Chesapeake Bay. Pennsylvania is a very significant um, part of the watershed, of course. So work happening at the local and county level contributes to the state goal um, and county plans are being, developed, are being developed now to contribute to the state plan. Um, so you can think about it kind of like these overlapping layers of, of pieces here where you have communities that have stormwater permits or MS4. Some of them have stormwater fees, which are an option to pay for the MS4 programs or infrastructure programs. We have other municipalities that don't have MS4 permits. We have agricultural landscape that, that also contributes to stormwater. And then we have wastewater treatment plants, um, which also have either overflow or outfall devices that, that contribute to our surface water. So basically the idea is that all the activities that occur across the landscape, you can even think about it, you know, in the quarter acre residential lot, the whole way up through these, these more sophisticated infrastructure programs, all these things that contribute to stormwater contribute towards countywide action plan goals, which also contribute to Pennsylvania's phase three whip. So we're basically looking for all local actions to, to roll up into Pennsylvania's um, potential success with implementing, with implementing um, the phase three whip and helping the Chesapeake Bay cleanup. So that's why we're here, but we're not here for the Bay. We're here for local water quality. So our cap is, is basically has four hubs associated with it. We, we, we need to have a better handle on all the existing best management practices or BMPs that are on the landscape. We need to encourage landowners to uh, implement new practices. To do that, of course, we, we need more funding to, to make those things happen. And the other tricky thing with this is that we have a deadline of 2025. Um, this relates back to the phase three with itself and uh, the agreement among the, the states in, uh, within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So when HRG was hired, um, we, we uh, explained that we really, we, we advised the county to focus on, on developing an implementable plan, not very high, you know, try not, try to have it not be so high level that it's very difficult to implement. 
have a better sense of the geographies where we really want to focus efforts, the amount of EMPs that really make sense, and the amount of funding it's going to take to make it happen. So we've started out our outreach as of today. So you, um, we'll continue to have small group Zooms with, with individuals like yourselves here for the next month or two. Um, we are utilizing county staff resources. As I mentioned, Tri-County Regional Planning Commission pulled together the fabulous website. And uh, we do have water quality focus areas. I have some maps in the slideshow here that, that I'll flip through here briefly. So we have a good sense for what the science tells us about the chemistry and, and land use and things like that that typically impact stormwater quality. Um, but one of the things we really wanted to get a better sense for today are other variables or co-benefits of improvements to Dauphin County. That's why I was curious to hear individually what, what people like the most about the county because that can help me as a consultant have a better sense for what are the things that really matter to these individuals that may not be stormwater related because stormwater doesn't get everybody excited. But if the diversity of the landscape does or having brew pubs locally does, well, brew pubs need clean water for the beer to be consistently brewed. So it can be a reason for us to have conversations with not so traditional stakeholders. So we'll unpack this a bit here. So we know the problem. We have the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. It's the reason for the phase three whip in the first place. Um, we're aware of solutions in that Chesapeake Bay has non-point source EMPs, meaning um, practices that can be applied to the landscape that don't necessarily discharge at a pipe. Um, and there's lots of planning and assessments that are done. But what I'm more interested in is the other variables that are important to you. They might be things like, and if you could type it in the chat, that would be great. Um, some of the things I think about are uh, the recreation aspects within the county, um, the tourism that may result uh, from it, and downtowns that are near these, these um, these recreation areas that benefit whenever people come, come by. So um, if you wouldn't mind throwing in the chat some of your thoughts with respect to opportunities in the county that you think we should be focusing on in a parallel path with stormwater, try to figure out if we could connect those up. That would, that would be an interesting, interesting thing. And if you have any thoughts off the top of your head, feel free to unmute yourself. I'll pause here for a second. All right, so into the CAP components it, itself. Um, examples of best management practices that we're interested in are things like tree buffers, uh, stream restoration projects, wetland restoration, rain gardens, tree plantings, detention basin retrofits, things that, that a lot of you have probably been involved in or, or have been around. Um, so one of the things that, that we'll be doing as part of the plan implementation is, is checking out maps like this that identify existing wetlands and a new uh, layer from the University of Vermont that identifies potentially restorable wetlands um, and utilizing programs like the Master Watershed Stewards to be able to have more people that can talk with landowners about the potential of their landscape. So an interesting project that, that stewards might, might want to, to work with is looking in maps in geographies that they're personally invested in, maybe they have some landowner relationships to see again, the, the potential of the landscape itself. Um, so again, curious what your thoughts are about types of BMPs that, that you complete now, or if there are some that you think your organization would like to get involved in and want to learn more about. So Aaron, I have one thought and that is just that, um, you know, and, and we've heard about this from other organizations, but there's, um, there are now these studies that are showing the highest, the places that most need the riparian buffers, yes. where they'll do the most good. And that's the kind of thing that would be really helpful to us. And I'm sure, you know, Kristen is thinking that too, because um, you know, when we decide where to do our next tree planting, you know, we, 
although we preserve land, there's some land we can't preserve and we just try to help the landowner steward it better or we help a municipality or put, you know, we put tree plantings on FEMA lands and things like that. So like if we know where, where we should be expending our effort, that's really helpful. I appreciate the thought, Sally. Um, one of the partners that we started working with last year in Center and Carmelin County for the same project is the Chesapeake Conservancy. And they use um, high, high res aerial photography and, and have algorithms to be able to basically run that. So similar to the restorable wetland layer, we can put on the, the riparian buffer layer of various widths because 15 feet works for some, 35 is great, 100 is the Cadillac. Um, can give you a sense for where the need is to, to exactly your point. So it sounds like if that data set were available to Dauphin County, that would be a helpful thing for your organization. Aaron, for what it's worth, first of all, Scott Scheffler just joined us. Um, but other than that, there are some things that uh, Ann typed into the chat box. I don't know if you've seen that. Didn't notice that. Thanks, Ann. Backyard stream planting, stewardship and gardening. Looking at vegetated swales in place of turf. Yes, planted and mown detention basins. We love our turf, don't we, as Americans? <laughs> But there, there's so many developments that are still depending on those um, those sort of shallow grass planted and then eventually mown. Even though it's wet and the mowers are getting stuck, they're still out there mowing and it's like, God, why don't you just plant some trees? But I think it's something the tech, the, the technology and the science needs to catch up with the with the developers and the and the municipalities that are um, approving these developments with these detention basins. Mm -hmm. Planning staff, do you have any comments about this? I'm thinking ordinances myself. Well, it'd be nice to have uh, tall grass and weed ordinances that were uh, environmentally friendly. And those people who were tend to not want to grow their or cut their grass would be uh, be good. Uh, yeah. I think part of it is working with the enforcement group in terms of recognizing areas that might be uh, of uh, uh, high potential within the municipalities to, to try and work with them and with the property owners to see where you can uh, possibly uh, get some areas that might make sense that are constant problem areas anyway. Mm -hmm. One thing I've another noticed one on, a plan, on the other one on the planning end of things, in fact, we've been kind of talking internally is whenever we get development applications in and we see uh, these communities uh, just approving stormwater plans, but uh, they would make a great BMPs on top of it to make them aware that, uh, you know, why don't you approach the developers and talk about how you can coordinate some programs so that you could. Uh, Put in the stormwater just to help the flooding, but also to get some qual water quality issues in it. Developers don't think of water quality per se. They think of what a, what a, what does the ordinance say and how do I get uh, you know, my stormwater to meet the, the approval process. I think that's something we need to talk to all of the municipalities on saying here's a here's a good opportunity for you. Um, why don't you look at that and work with them. Because while you have them during the development process is the one time that they're really most anxious to listen to. So. It's a great idea. Sketch plan. The sketch plan um, stage of a project is, is really the opportunity for that. And some municipalities skip that step. One thing that seems really obvious to me is that there's a big knowledge gap between the county planning and the um, township municipal planning. And you know, you somebody mentioned ordinances, and you know, maybe if they had some model ordinances, or there was just some way to have a conduit. You know, I've been in township government before, and there's not really 
there's not really anything at the township level, you know, unless you care about it, that provides the expertise that the county is able to have. So if if either the county could there the county planning could have some teeth in it that requires some of the municipal um, planning to be done that way, or if there could be an education process or you know model ordinances provided or things like that, I think it'd be make a huge difference. Yeah. Great suggestion. Well, that, that's that is a good point, and I think one of the things that we're doing right now is is taking a good look at our model ordinances for a number of different issues. And that's, uh, that's certainly something we can we can uh, dive deeper into because again, uh, I, I do agree there is a, uh, the, some of these communities are somewhat overwhelmed whenever a development comes through and uh, you know, we provide them a, uh, a lot of uh, assistance. Most of the time, whenever a development comes through, they think most traffic, 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 because that's yeah. what people are talking about. And uh, we, we, uh, we need to make them aware of water quality as well, because that's just as important. That's a great uh, corollary there, Jerry. I hadn't thought of it that way. And interest, it is an interesting, the traffic flow, you know, it's, it's a similar type thing where it's all capacity and that's great. Great comments, everybody. So another component um, is with respect to all the existing plans that are out there. Uh, we have a listing here of those that the county shared with us. Um, Rob, not sure if you have a perspective you wanna share here, but they're all of various stages of life, right? Some of them are, are quite old. Some of them are, are quite new and um, are, are in the throes of implementation. Um, organizationally, are, are, do you all have a hand in helping to implement some of these plans? And secondly, are there any other watershed plans worth pursuing? Again, maybe dusting an old one off the shelf, um, watershed that you might have in the back of your mind that, that hasn't had much uh, restoration plan work done to it. Spring Creek, Dairy, and Conewago. Mm -hmm. That's Spring Creek East, Eric. One year Hershey. Yeah. Yes, Spring Creek East. Okay, thanks. I think you have to look at where the, you know, where the development is, and um, and maybe some of these, some of these plans need revisited or updated. You know, it's. Uh, but I feel like the, the, the Spring Creek one is, uh, is ripe for a, a cold water conservation plan. Um, it may stir, stir a pot, but you know, whatever, it's what it is. I don't know if you noticed, Sally just put in the in the thing about pals and this trip. Yeah, you're yes. about working on on streams that are already um, are doing okay. I think you're right. I think protecting what we have is is, is important, um, just as important as as um, you know trying to res do restoration work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely. Um, I don't know of any. Um, planning stuff that's going on up there. Um, but it's certainly, again, that would be another one that at least the upper part, uh, some of the upper branches, some of the branches of, of PALS and Armstrong's the same way, um, could probably use a, you know, a cold water conservation plan or a watershed implementation plan, something like that. Um, the funding for the cold water conservation plans is, is fairly, um, fairly easy to easy to get and and the plans are are relatively um, um, relatively easy to to put together um, especially uh, it's one that um, 
there's a lot of data out there already that we can just kind of put together and and have a have a good plan and it just qualifies you or or makes you eligible for fee, for um, additional funding to do work in the in the watershed. So. That's a great point. And did you want to speak more about Spring Creek West or Scott? Thanks for joining us, Scott. I think Scott should. <laughs> Scott, are you there? Yeah, he he may be. Uh, he yeah, I, just been... have to, I just have to figure out uh, exactly what I need to do here to get. Uh, I don't know. I was having trouble finding the mute button, but. We can hear you now. No, I know. What what uh, I mean, there's the uh, the Greenbelt Association because it's affecting um, the erosion along Spring Creek West is affecting the trail as uh, taking an interest in restoring parts of it. I mean, at one point there were several people approaching Paxton Creek Watershed Group and saying, hey, can you adopt um, Spring Creek West because it's just the next one over. And we, we're not in a position to take on more at this time, um, organization-wise and volunteer force-wise and overloaded-wise. But the more I heard about that little, there's a, just a few little tribs um, and where it runs and then I read Rob's um, latest 2019, I believe, um, survey data, and that there's some cold water in that in those streams, or there was, and so it's actually still classified as a cold water waterway. So, I mean, I, I almost feel like there's so much development, there's so much urbanization around it. It's but it's still surviving. And it's still connecting in these very interesting places like at the Capitol Greenbelt, you know, and I, it's just this little unique, almost sort of secret little watershed and I, I would hate to see it further destroyed, but it's just going begging. Yeah, it's uh, uh, the, There's a Forgive me if you already know these things, but uh, on the Route 83 at uh, the Rutherford House Spring House, uh, there is a cold water spring that comes out of the ground there. It's uh, you know near the confluence of uh, tributaries, and from that point on, um, it is considered a cold water wild trout, uh, brown trout, not not brooks. Uh, not brookie, brookies, but uh, brown trout. And uh, restoration activity down there was started by the Doc Fritchie chapter of Trout Unlimited. And, uh, you know, because we had some issues in the Pakistan section, um, you know, we took on the, uh, you know, the restoration of the, what we call the Parkway Tributary, the Parkway Creek Tributary that runs from Market Street to Dairy, but we're not a watershed organization, and we're a, we're a, a trail, <laughs> and our people are interested in uh, bicycling and uh, and trails. So I've I've been um, I've been shepherding some of this work. Um, we're submitting a grant application for a section of uh, the main stem near the Ivy Lane Apartments. It's going in today, I think. Uh, growing greener and back in April we submitted a C2P2 grant to uh, to leverage some money the city gives us for maintenance to uh, try to get 1800 trees in the lower section between 28th street and 19th street. It's a great point you made Scott because I, I do know some about what your organization does and I think we've we visited some sites in the past together many years ago. And I kind of forget that you're a trail organization, not a stream organization um, because you are involved in it. But I can appreciate that the bulk of the membership may not have a lot of interest in this. So to Anne's point, you almost need a partner watershed group 
so you can work together on things, you know, to expand your capacity. Yeah, I was, I was one of the people Ann was talking about that was uh, asking if uh, oh. <laughs> there might be, might be some synergy there. But uh, yeah. I mean, working together is, 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 is fine um, where we can. Rob, I saw you unmuted. What's your thought? Well, I was contacted by Ann telling me that they were thinking about having sort of a, a joint venture in their efforts there. And I mean, just kind of reiterating what Scott was saying, they are the trail organization, but so much of their work is in, in with the water. And um, I think Paxton has a handle on more of the water things. And if they could kind of join forces, uh, you know, a lot of times what I'll run into um, is there's an organization that has uh, a burst of energy or uh, a motivation to do something and then they're looking for a project. And then in other areas, there's a project, but um, maybe not uh, the associated, you know, group of people who are there to see it through. So, um, I understand the point of being hesitant to take on, you know, an entire other watershed uh, under your purview, and that's fine. But um, a lot of watershed associations are small as it is, and I think if you can kind of join forces and not view it as much as being burdensome, but maybe being greater than the sum of the parts when you work together. Um, the That's problem what I was for us, that. Rob, we did um, have a, actually I didn't attend the session, but they did, they did have a breakout brainstorming session over that. And right now the, the they, they, there has not been a board vote yet, but it's, it's not looking good. We're, we're just so overwhelmed with the lack of volunteers <laughs> that things are, are really, really tough. Um, so it's, it's just not looking good. I'm not saying never. So don't lose hope. But you know, I was wondering if there's a good and, and I've tried to reach this guy is a, a man who came to an event table at Braybill Park in Lower Paxton Township by the name of Jim Seidler, who is like owns a quite a bit of land with woods along parts of this of the Spring Creek West water network and he's trying to I believe he's on the Greenway committee for Lower Paxton Township I've tried to reach him I've asked the township to put me in touch with him I can't get back in touch with him he seemed like the kind of individual that would be the right person to give birth to a, a watershed and or, um, I don't know, just some kind of little organization that could steward those two little, it's like there's two little runs of something that go through his, past his land. He wanted to connect his Greenway or that this, I don't even know if it exists. There's this Greenway committee or commission for Lower Paxton Township, but I don't think there is a Greenway. I think they want one. So there's a group that we don't even know how to reach them that could be a potentially better steward slash um, advocate than, than Paxton Creek. I was oddly looking at that plan um, yesterday when we were having a little bit of a back and forth about that buffer with uh, Centennial, Centennial Acres. Yeah, that, um, and that, that, that kind of, falls into the same sort of thing where I like, I like having a meeting like this because there are different groups and organizations working and our communication between everyone is uh, not good. And I think if we can have a better line of communication, connect the people that want to do things with the projects that are available um, and leverage the resources off each other, I think that that can be helpful. Um, in in the projects that I've worked on, uh, I worked with Manada and with you know Penn State for doing the tree 
plantings and bringing them together, I wouldn't have been able to do it without them assisting me. Um, they can draw the volunteers for the certain projects. You know, if you're, I, I don't know what exactly, what projects that Paxson would be looking to do. And, you know, if it's just something along the lines of a tree planting, you know, I, I've talked to Kristen and I can get, you know, she can pull volunteers in if, the, if it's available for things like that. I guess I um, should say the lack of projects, like we have trees and we don't sure. have any stakeholders who, who want them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we have a tree nursery full of trees that are waiting for homes. And, you know, we've got to find the places, the buffers that need trees and there's not even anybody to do that because we're not connecting. And here, let's, I can bring this back to topic. Um, Aaron is um, the, reaching the residents, reaching the actual homeowners, the actual landowners, the actual developers and, and making them aware that, you know, it, you don't have to go to a nursery and buy a hundred dollar tree. You can get free trees. Yeah. We had people steal trees from parks, like just pull them up out of the ground with the tube. And it's like, oh my God, don't we have more. <laughs> you know, that's what we're here for. But there is no outreach to the public, at least in my township, as far as, you know, teaching people. Yeah. If you don't mind, I'm going to skip through a ton of this technical stuff that you can check out another day. Because... These are the, some of the challenges and opportunities that we've heard from other watershed organizations, because if you're feeling any pain, it's a thing in this line of work. <laughs> so I'm hearing capacity for certain, um, municipal government relationships, possibly landowner relationships and tracking those relationships can be really challenging, even just in taking information as you try to get more membership into your organizations. Um, I'm wondering also in the grant administration aspect of this, and you know, that can be very overwhelming for volunteer groups as well. So I guess I sign on if it's a yes to all of these things, because even in terms of land maintenance, I'm thinking about buffers that get placed, but maybe nobody goes back later on to check on the little buddies. Um, maybe you have other challenges that, that we might actually be able to try to tackle with our plan. Well, Aaron, I, I would uh, expand on capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really have a, 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 I don't have any trouble getting volunteers to come out for an event. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, you know, people who will stick with it, uh, let's call them project leaders. Yes. That, uh, you know, that will take on, or that will take on a job on a regular basis. Yep. Uh, those those are more difficult for me. And does that, does anyone have any success with girl or boy scouts? Because we've been trying and trying to find a troop or an eagle scout, and and it just seems like I know COVID threw everything all out of whack, but it just seems like those individuals that wanted those kinds of projects in the past have disappeared. But that, that's a yeah, great source. I think of you're right. We haven't had much of that for the last year or two. We have had some really successful ones in the past though. Some nice tree plantings um, with Eagle Scouts. Um, and, you know, I tried to get maybe some, you know, there's a, I forget what it's called. There's an equivalent for girls, for girls. Gold, a gold star. Okay, and we had one project with them. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I suspect that if we did some more outreach, some of that might happen because we just sort of wait for them to come to us and say, do you have any projects? Casey, I'm step curious. back a little bit, Aaron. Just to take a step back to the just to, to touch base on the Spring Creek West thing. Yeah. Um. I think the obvious partner there is Doc Fritchie. Mm -hmm. To you. It's it's a wild 
trout, you know, they have wild trout there. They don't work there, uh, you know. Yeah, I wish um, Russ could have been on this call here live today. Yep. Another time. As I was scrolling through the list, Casey, I was, I'm curious if you have thoughts here in terms of challenges, opportunities from the Penn State Extension perspective and the stewards. Yeah, um, <clears throat> this, I mean, obviously this past year has been strange in all accounts, but connecting opportunities for stewards has been what I'm trying to do. And for me, it's, I provide opportunities. So if there's something coming up between organizations that they're like, oh, I need volunteers for a work day or, let me know, and I will forward those on to our stewards. Um, it is, has been tough, like, you know, we get some people like, and, you know, they're highly invested, you know, they're, they're leading projects, but then we have those other ones that I provide all these opportunities and they don't connect. So it's, you know, I mean, and that's volunteers in general, you know how it goes. So, but I would say for the group at large, you know, if stuff's coming up that you need volunteers, let me know. And then I know even Scott, you mentioned like, you know, if there's one of those ongoing projects that, you know, needs someone to maybe not oversee, but needs like a longer commitment, those are opportunities too that I try to get the stewards connected with. So it's not like these one off opportunities, but it's getting connected through an organization. So um, either or I we provide, it's just a matter. I, I mean, I can't guarantee that someone will do it, but, you know, we hope people will step up and we plan to you know, do trainings for the next couple of years every spring. So we'll be adding to our group. But currently in Dauphin County, I think we have about 16 stewards. So so we have a new class that is looking for opportunities. So I, I'll put my email in the, in the box so if people need it and want to reach out. That's great, Casey. And for the sake of the group that doesn't know, how many how many service hours do the stewards need on an annual basis to keep their status? Yep, in their first year, they need 50, which technically the first year is like a year and a half. They have to get 50, but then every an annually after that, they need 20 volunteer. Okay, thank you. But a lot of people end up getting more. I will say that, uh, Casey, um, Bill Fee and Ellen Shank and I have connected because I had no idea they worked for the state library. And Bill teaches at the STEM lab for this PA state library. So that is gonna be something they're gonna to try to get us, get PEQA um, connected with some outreach to, to their students and, and you know some synergy there. So there's an example of where in, within a master watershed steward class, you find networking opportunities. Mm -hmm. But that makes me wonder in this CAP world that we're talking about here, this type of planning, would a library or an educational group or a uh, school be so, uh, someone you would wanna engage somehow in, in this? The answer is yes. You know, from my perspective, the easy answer is yes, and especially science teachers that that want their students to have an experience in this type of thing. Um, but but it could potentially go further than that, right? You know, you could think about art classes, and we're looking for creativity, right? So, um, and again, if 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 the plan implementation is going to be successful, we we have to reach further than than just this group. You know, because a lot of you have been doing this for a lot of years and it's a lot of effort. So for us to meet our goals, we have to scale things up. And to do that, we need to get get others involved. Um, so Anne, as you were talking about trying to get more volunteers, yes and yes, <laughs> absolutely understand that. Um, I'm gonna jump around a little bit because I am mindful of time. Feel free to, to stay on a little longer if, if, you, if that accommodates for your schedule. And Steve, I'm assuming that if we go past four, Zoom isn't going to disintegrate. Do you know you're muted? Well, 
I guess we'll see. I know, <laughs> the anticipation, right? Um, so with respect to your work, um, again, when I say your work, I'm thinking about the riparian buffers that you've planted, the stream restoration projects you've been involved in, any type of planning exercise you've been involved in. The, the CAST model is the Chesapeake Bay model. It's, uh, it's a model based upon a number of inputs like land use and septic and wastewater treatment, precipitation, elevation, soil type, this whole listing on the left-hand side. Um, the bulk of this data input results in some sort of water quality reduction, right? Because a lot of land use decreases the amount, the, the quality of stormwater runoff as an example. That's why we put best management practice in place through the land development process or stormwater permit. So, so that's why we also need to have an accounting of all the different BMPs on the agricultural side and, and the typical development side. So uh, we're working with the county to identify the, the, a listing of BMP types and quantities of types that, that are going to be our goals uh, for our plan. And um, basically, we end up doing an iterative process similar to how this looks, where we identify the BMPs we, we want to include in our goals, we run the model, we see if we, if we meet the standard that's been set up for us. The, the key, though, is this. Nitrogen is, is, the, the, is the constituent that we're most concerned about. Probably up until today, the majority of you have only ever been thinking about sediment because if you're working with any of the MS4s, that's what we've been preaching. For the sake of the countywide action plan, BMPs that capture sediment sometimes capture nitrogen, but not always. But the thing that we really care about is getting more BMPs into the cast model itself because the model sees land use changes, it sees precipitation and things very easily. It doesn't know anything about Pennsylvania's BMPs until we tell it. So one of the key aspects that, that, we're, that we're thinking about is documenting existing BMPs. So one of the things we might end up asking you in the future is, could you help us understand where, where you've placed all of your buffers or where you've placed or been a part of some stream restoration projects? Uh, because again, if it's not in the model, even if it's on the landscape and it's not mature forest yet, Pennsylvania doesn't get so-called credit for that project, even though it's performing at a very high level. The other aspect of this is building more BMPs. So we are going to need assistance from organizations like yours and additional uh, master watershed stewards to help us work with landowners to, to get additional projects like these on the ground. Uh, because for those of you that have worked in the field, it, it's, it's a slog to work with landowners, get funding in place, get construction done, or get the volunteers pulled together if, if it's that level of project. So the, the documenting existing BMPs was really the point I wanted to make with this group because I just simply want to say thank you for all of the work that you've done for some of you for, for decades, because it, it gives people examples that are new to this game about what the work is like, what these BMPs um, look like. And I think it was to, An to Anne's point that, that we can do things a different way than, than having acres and acres of turf, right? You, you can have some more conservation landscaping type approaches and, and they can be very approachable. Okay, so we talked about challenges and opportunities. Um, next question we we'd like to get some feedback on is, thinking forward three years, five years, how can we help you achieve your goals? You know, some of you, I think, have um, mission statements and you know, organizational structure that, that visions your future. Are there some things in there that, that are, are on track, but you could use more assistance with or um, aspects that you think you maybe are behind where you'd like them to be. And, and perhaps this type of program could be a catalyst for some success. Um, I guess I would say one thing here and that and partly, um, although we do a number of restoration tree plantings every year, um, our main focus is really to um, protect land. Right. And so, you know, by definition, our conservation easements, when we put an easement on a property, we're automatically 
putting BMPs on that property because our easements require a hundred foot buffer from any defined wet area. Mm -hmm. So any help that we can get to connect with landowners, especially along streams. And, um, you know, sometimes landowners are willing to do an easement if they can be compensated. Um, some, so we have done quite a number with grants. Um, and other, time, other times they, they'll donate. Um, we've tried to own property along the streams and then we can manage them ourselves. So, so um, our approach to, to water quality is so tied to the land, which I think everyone is beginning to realize. Um, and we have a lot of different um, grant opportunities that have helped us a lot and so you know, maybe just considering the land preservation opportunities tie in so well is a really important point. Um, you know, our, and back to the volunteer thing, our, our problem is in, with capacity is not so much getting volunteers. We often have a really great turnout um, and sometimes some corporations have groups they want to do a project and we, you know, they contact us and we do that. Um, our capacity issue is is the staff issue, um, you know, and having the funding to pay staff to do administration and to keep track of everything. Going back to what you have here about landowner relationships and yeah. maintenance, so you know, we just have to make sure that we keep track beyond just sticking the trees in the ground, um, and that that does require staff. So. So you're tracking legacy projects and project leads, right? Like landowners that may not quite said yes to preservation, but are on your radar through, you know, the whole yeah. easement legal process. Well, we have this one program. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it, Erin. It's the, um, the Soterra Stewardship Program along right. with Soterra. And we, we started that because um, there, the Soterra Creek is such a valuable corridor, but it has so many little tiny pieces of land owned by different people. It has municipal land, it has commercial land. So for those properties we can't protect, we, we have this program where people can sign up and all. It's non-binding, but they just say they'll leave a 35 foot buffer. They won't mow down to the creek. And then some of those people that signed up for that, we've like provided trees to them and it's just sort of a foot in the door education kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but it's that's worked especially with the municipalities really well. Sally, a follow up question too on capacity. Do you, as an organization, have more preservation interest than funding? Oh, yeah. Okay. And we, ha I mean, we have, we have some good funding. We have a lot of funding partners and, you know, we work with other organizations and sort of pull our resources. Um, I'm really happy about how that is, but I mean, I, I drive by properties all the time that I think, you know, I, if, I, if I could offer a compensation or if we could buy that piece of land, you know, yeah. it could be preserved. So, I mean, obviously we in the, we in the land trust we're always like when we think about what we do if we won the lottery it's always like we buy land <laughs> we're not making more of it right <laughs> right <laughs> all right does anybody else have some thoughts about these questions Okay, let's see what else we got here. This is the last slide. Next steps. So our team's going to be working on writing a plan. Uh, it is due September 30th to DEP. So this is a very, very quick process. Uh, you're going to expect to receive an email um, in August, likely, for an open house where uh, we're going to capture the things that, that I and the county partners took notes on from your thoughts here today. Um, we're going to try to incorporate as much of that into our plan so that the plan can be a good reason for us to work together on um, funding opportunities in the future. So as an example, with Manita being um, a leader in the Swatera Creek watershed, 
if there's a particular initiative that we see formulates within Soterra Creek, we could not only apply for the actual water related project, but we could work with the Conservancy on um, the budget for additional staff capacity if the board wants to proceed with something like that. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking pretty big and we need to <laughs> for the county to, to even get close to meeting the goals the DEP set out for us. Um, so if, if you have any, any follow-up thoughts from the discussion today, um, you have a board meeting and, and you might bring this up with some of your board members, please do uh, email me or Steve or Eric, whoever you know the best, um, with any type of follow thoughts that you have. And um, we'll be interested in working with you for, for implementation. We do, um, we're gonna be working through some, some model related BMP scenarios or BMP mixes here. And to make the implementation work, we're gonna identify the amount of funding needed and anticipate a partners for different types of initiatives. So when we have our public review of our plan, we're gonna ask you specifically, scroll through here and tell us if this makes sense. Did we plug you into the right, right places? It's not a commitment, it's a potential partner type, type approach. Um, there's some, I, I, Ident, um, things identified here in green that, that we are looking for feedback on. However, um, a follow-up email would be fine if, if your organization has something available to help us here. Um, a project inventory is something we're thinking about because we wanna have a sense for how difficult will it be to try to um, capture existing practices that are already on the ground. So if your organization does keep track of those things, that would be helpful for us to know. Item number two is what are your project plans for 2022? So I know a lot of you have state funding for, for buffers and, and other types of projects. Um, if you kind of know what you might be constructing next year, again, that can help us uh, have a better sense for if our goals are achievable because everything you do contributes to the county goals. And then lastly, are there partners that we're missing? Um, I think there were more people registered for today's webinar than actually participated, but um, if there are some key relationships that, that you have that you think need to be involved in this, please uh, share our contact information or, or simply let us know who those individuals are so we can be sure to touch base with them. Hey, Aaron, if I could just add to that real quick, just sure. a reminder that that we, we are recording this and after, you know, when we have that posted to, to our website, we'll, we'll send a link out um, to all the invitees to this. But as, as Aaron was just indicating, if, if you do have relationships with groups or individuals that, you know, that you feel would be interested in, that's something you could also share um, with you know, whoever you feel might be a, a, a good engaged partner if they're not on the list that we have. Any last thoughts before we hang up? Kristen says, Capital Region Water and the Hershey Trust. Thank you, Kristen. Capital Region Water is on the uh, municipal list. Uh, for one of these meetings. Harrisburg mm -hmm. University. And there's a big project through Audubon to do plantings and um, we're involved in a what they're calling a green ribbon landscape grant to try to get um, plantings along the most, uh, most needed places. Um, green ribbon landscapes are like huge huge corridors, like 300 feet more. Um, I will email you about that with a contact. That'd and they're also doing some urban work um, to try to get some plantings, like this is something that might might make sense um, to partner with the Green Belt organization and some other smaller projects in Harrisburg that are being done just to get vegetation in the different areas. Mm -hmm. It's a great suggestion. Thank you. Any other last thoughts here? 
really appreciate your participation today. And um, again, feel free to email any of us if you're interested in being in more of an advisor role, if you wanna, you know, see how the car runs, not just drive it later on. Um, we'll be happy to work with you. So I'll stay on the line for a little longer in case any of you wanna chat, but that concludes the end of the conversation today. Again, really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, this was really nice. And my <laughs> apologies for being late. I do think that some of the breweries in Harrisburg might make really good partners. I know Trove's partners with the Nature Conservancy on yeah. October Forest and they do special beers, maybe a Zero Day and or what's the other one down there? Um, well, ABC is right mm -hmm. on Paxton Creek. Right. I know Trogues did one with the Nature Conservancy. Yeah. Um, but the, there are some actually in city breweries now that some of the, the newer, younger ones that might be all over this as far as, you know, the clean water angle. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Anne, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about some of the new coffee shops too. Because, yeah, they're not brewing beer, but coffee doesn't taste right if the water is not, not right. Elementary coffee at the Broad yeah. Street Market would be fantastic, and little lamps as well. Um, they're young, they're progressive, they're eco-conscious. They they believe in like I know little lamps is every time they have any kind of meeting or whatever they acknowledge the territory that it's being held on the the indigenous territory. So I think they would be yeah. open-minded. Yeah. So. Do you know the owners? Yeah, I do know I have some connections there through strange things, but yeah, I, I okay. could I could reach out or uh, I'll, I'll get you there. Yeah, I need to stop trying to connect people. Right, Rob? <laughs> right, Scott? <laughs> the three of us that are left are the matchmakers. <laughs> I don't think the connection is bad. Yeah, um, no, no, knowing. it's not. It's not. Um, but yeah, I'll get you some contacts. That would be super. I really appreciate yeah. that. So like I said, we need new kids. We, we can't do it all. Yep. Um, yeah, along that line, you know, I, there in the northern part of the county, we had um, Wiconisco Creeks Water Association. I guess I don't know if she was contacted. You know, I, I think she sometimes have trouble um, getting in contact by email, um, but there's some folks up there too. And again, it's a, they run into capacity issues um, doing some of these things. It's all over. So I'm bringing that up to tell Scott and Anne that everyone has unique and similar problems with the different places that they work, so. But I do like the idea of bringing in more partners. Like when you're talking about the coffee shops and the breweries, um, I don't know what shape that takes uh, getting them in there if that's more of like an awareness thing yeah. and then with Publicity, the awareness you can bring um, in your buzz volunteers yeah buzz and awareness yeah imagine if there was a little thing on the coffee table you know like where you're sitting drinking your beer or whatever and it has their beer selection on the other side it says something about the watershed in which they're sitting yeah you know you never know have a qr code there so kids can get on their phone and learn more the beer after it that's a great point that that could get a lot of traction too yeah. and not that there's a theme here or anything but i think jerry just mentioned wineries as well you, right you yes right <laughs> well thank again, you very that much that would just be informational you think with those with those groups that would just more be have their name involved with the, the the greater project sort of, or is there gonna be events there? I, I don't know. I, I could see them if they are going to be, they, they do a lot of events, like they go to city events and, and so they, I don't know, I just, maybe they could become 
clean water ambassadors. Maybe okay. it could be a Dauphin County, County network water. of clean water. What, what county has the big water week? Is that York? That's Lancaster. Lancaster. And, and it's big, some, you're right. <clears throat> some of that stuff would be similar to that. I mean, I would think they would, they would probably jump on that. I know we, we were, we were starting to do some stuff with that Paxton Creek um, consideration as all part of that PennDOT project and everything. And that, that really kind of started and stopped and started. But ABC was uh, uh, very interested in it and in fact helped. Uh, Good. Interested, you know, talking about some of that because their property is very long yeah. there. So I mean. Yeah. yeah, we hold our annual meeting there um, when there's not a pandemic happening so yeah. <laughs> hopefully in the fall in the it's october um and that would be a great place and we'll make sure all of these people are, are invited to that and it'd be great to it's a it ends up being a good networking um opportunity mm -hmm. we have like a slider bar and a beer ticket and and we sit around and talk and award our volunteer of the year and bemoan how overworked we all are <laughs> <laughs> but but that we need to get out of that cycle because it like you i my thing is remember the the ducks at the carnival that were in the little thing going around and around and you're probably all too young but i, don't, I can't remember how you won the game but but they're all just like bumping into each other and they're in this little like yes. circling and and that's what this is like it's like we're in this endless circling bobbing thing and and it's hard to get and go in a direction and accomplish well, something I, I think from my perspective i've, I've worked for minis worked for or with municipalities for almost 15 years now and it seems that even when you have some legitimate staff capacity you know it's somebody's job every day you're still always just dealing with the fire or the very lowest hanging fruit and so it's hard to do the big stuff. You know, the Pax, the Paxton Creek study that PennDOT did, my goodness, it, it came up with a lot of grand ideas, right, that are very expensive, that takes somebody, a team of people likely, that are motivated to make it happen. And I, I think that's just very difficult for most of us to just pick up and carry forward. So, you know, you take the small wins and you get tired and then you get a little energized and you pick a new project up and I, I think that's just the way it goes. Yeah. Hey, uh, another idea popped into my head. Uh, this, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to get into it, uh, but uh, the environmental team core that uh, the city's doing again this year, um, they, uh, they recruit a whole bunch of kids and they have them do projects all summer. And if they complete the, and they, and they, uh, there's also uh environmental training and at the end they get a uh, I think 1500 bucks if they complete it the student gets 1500 dollars yep wow where do I sign up <laughs> that sounds like fun <laughs> well, it's, it's I it's, could go back to school for something and I can uh, get a student it, ID of some sort it's it's it is it's considered work <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'm not afraid of that. <laughs> but who, who, what organization does that run through? Um, I'm thinking the Housing Authority, uh, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. I, it's, it's years ago, um, someone thought that, uh, that I might be able to use these kids on the Greenbelt, but that's never materialized. But, you know, if, if someone is in a an outreach mode, uh, especially with educating youth, yeah, it would be a fine, fine opportunity. Yeah, truly. Do you want me to send you something? Absolutely, whatever you if have. I, if I can find it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I made the note of environmental team core Harrisburg Housing Authority question mark. They do there summer you. projects and get environmental training. There you go. <laughs> That's great. Because, you know, in, in this line of work, too, it seems that there's there's two populations that are the easiest to engage 
students and retirees, people that are in the middle just have a hard time committing. And I've been trying to figure out some ways to get past it. I'm tired of banging my head against the wall, so I just gotta embrace it. And um, I, I, so I do wanna figure out some ways to engage the student population in a way where it's not just a one-off, where it really builds that passion. Cause you can make a career in this stuff. You know, it's not just for fun when you're in school. Yeah, it's that's the soccer mom segment where they're so busy with the kids school and school and after school activities and sports yeah. that there's no time and you can't really hold it against them because they literally are probably struggling just to pick up this kid and get supper on the table. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why you have the retirees, you know, having more flexibility. Mm -hmm. I'm but but Pequa, Paxson Creek Association has always wanted to engage families with young children. And that is still our goal is to make it a family activity, you know, family, the family that plants the buffer together, <laughs> you know, and, but they, you know, there's so many little creeks running through my neighborhood and there are kids that are playing and they have pools and they're totally ignoring the creeks and their, and their parents are mowing right up to the edge and there's all kind of fertilizer. It's just, it could be something that it could be a huge segment of the pop of, of this area that could make a difference mm -hmm. if you could just reach them. But I've actually run into some that are not even willing to talk about environmental. They, they you know, I start talking about, you know, having a service uh, fertilize your lawn. Sometimes they overdo it and they, they don't want to be told how to fertilize their lawns or how much grass to have. And they get sort of negative. So you can't really take that approach. You have to, it has to be something fun mm -hmm. that they are gonna want to embrace. I don't know how you make that fun. But. I don't know either. And I, I think though there's, there's not gonna be a silver bullet, right? And we're not gonna get everybody. Mm -hmm. That's just not the world we live in, but um, you know. You can just start that. getting some people because then they might see their neighbors doing it and go, hey, what's, what's go where'd you get those free trees? And yeah. you know, then it would start to catch on. I mean, that is, I have seen that happen. Well, and I'm curious to see how the pandemic um, may change some behavior. And as younger generations are becoming homeowners, you know, cash is tight, chances are they won't be spending money on, on fertilizer. You know, like, I, I think there may be some incremental changes that are just gonna happen. For the sake of this project, goodness, how in the world do we capture those as BMPs, right? Like that scale is crazy. Um, but to your point, it's really what it's going to take, you know, for the creeks to be safe to play in and, and everything else. Thank you for that link, Scott. I put it in my notes. Yeah, it's, uh, you're welcome. It does seem dated, but I did see a Facebook page, uh, post that they were taking applications for 2021, okay. somewhere along the line. That's great. This is certainly not, not enough time here for this summer, but something that we might want to think about for next year if we have, you know, yeah. a project that they can sink their teeth into. Yeah, I know last year when they were dealing with COVID, they, uh, they, they sort of morphed the program into uh, sanitizing playground equipment, uh, some, something along those lines. But you can see from that picture and the link that uh, I think the 2019 class was huge. A um, lot of kids, a lot of kids. Anyway. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to scoot. Yeah, me too. Right. I'll take care. Thanks again for your input. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Thanks. See you guys. Thanks for hosting. Sure.